How many of you know Apostle Don Wells? Raise your hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A mighty man with a word for now, a rhema word. So get ready, get your pens out, run and get your pens, get what you need, and come back so that you can hear Apostle Don Wells give us this awesome message on today. Welcome, Apostle Don Wells. Amen. Can we give him a hand clap? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. To God be all the glory. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. It is no exaggeration to say I am so happy to be here. I don't know about you, but I'm just, uh, I, I just need a hug. That's the hardest part. I, I know that sounds funny, doesn't it? That, that's the hardest part. I just miss loving people. I feel the virtual hugs coming in. I love those. We've got them. We'll hold those until we get to the real thing. But I'm so honored to be here. I'm grateful to stand behind this holy desk. It's been a tough season for everyone, but we're, we're making it through and we're thriving. We're thriving. Say, well, I don't feel like we are. We are. We're thriving. I'll tell you up front, I've got a little bit of restricted movement this morning from my neck. Um, yeah, it was really tough. I slept wrong. About three days ago, I slept on my pillow wrong, and I, I was telling Apostle Buddy, I've got a friend of mine, a pastor. We've been friends for about 20 years. He was one of the first members to start Team Impact and the guys who break all the stuff and rip telephone books, and he's always doing something. And we were always, through the years, calling each other. He'd say, I cracked two ribs on my motorcycle. Yeah, I bruised my tailbone on my mountain bike. Yeah, I did this. And I called him the other day, and we were sharing stories, and most of it was, yeah, I... What did you do to your neck? I slept wrong. What did you do to your back? I was trying to tie my shoes. I said, boy, this getting old stuff is not for the faint of heart. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have, I mean, I'm not there yet, but I'm going to have to work on it. We're grateful and thank God for the ability to begin to come together, start moving back towards fellowship in person. I'm grateful for... Through this difficult time, the leadership of Apostle Buddy and Dr. Mary Crum were in good health. God's protected. We thank God for their leadership, what they've offered us through this. Continue to pray a hedge of protection and bubble around them at all times because they have many years of leadership yet to exude for us. So we are grateful for that. I'm, I'm so thankful for their relationship, their lives, and it's been very tough having more distance but they have always been present even in that. And uh, with a great word, great teaching, what he's been teaching on has been truth. Truth is not always easy, but we need it and we're thankful for it. So it's good that we do that. And you have to find the good in things. Find the good in the pandemic. Find the good in things when they're difficult. Find the good in the struggles. There's always something good that we can come up with. There's always something that we can say, Lord, this is, I'll find the good. Because God's always looking for us to find that. It's what separates us many times from the world. If nothing else, you can say, listen, I don't have to bathe or brush my teeth as often. I got six feet and a mask so I can save water. There's always something good that we can find. <laughs> Nobody's going to come near me now, huh? No, I just did my weekly bath this morning, so we're okay. Find the good. Find the good. It's easy when everything's pointed towards negative to look at all the loss, the hurt, the suffering, but find the good. There was a story of a young parents that had two twin boys, and one of the boys was very, very pessimistic. He always found negative. And the other son always was very optimistic. He found the optimism of everything. And they were just extreme opposites. And it really baffled the parents. And so finally they, went, they, they called in a team one day of psychiatrists and psychologists. And they said, please just help us understand our children. 
They said, absolutely. And so they created a room for the pessimist first. And out of this room, they put every bright color and bright light and all of the beautiful things that they could find and toys and every imaginable toy that was bright. And they found all the candies and bright. And they laid it out perfectly. Spent hours and hours creating this room. Then they brought in the young pessimist son and he came in and he was looking around and touching stuff. And he said, I, I don't like that candy. And there's, there's really, there's too much candy in here. And if I play with these toys, the batteries are going to go dead and run out. And then I won't be able to play with them anymore. And they were just baffled that he could find the negative and all that. So they noted everything. They put it down. They took him out. They got the next room ready for the optimistic child. And they just put in a whole, bu a whole bunch of horse manure. Just loaded the room full of horse manure all the way up to their knees. And they said, let's see what he does now. There's no way to find positive in this. And so they bring him in. And he stands there for a moment. And all of a sudden, with great elation, he just starts throwing stuff in there. Yay! Yay! Throwing horse manure all around. And they thought, what is going on? So they stopped, they ran in there, and they said, young man, what are you doing? He said, well, I, I, I just figured with all this horse manure, there must be a horse somewhere. <laughs> that was really a message for you more than a joke. You can find the good in anything. You really can. So I hope that we're positive through this, even in the challenges, because it's important to us to be able to find that, to be a light to the world, you know. It, in, my, in my going over the last few months, it's been much easier to talk to people about the Lord and what he's doing than any other time in my life. Because people are uniquely open right now. They want answers. Do you have the answer? Do you know what his name is? It's Jesus. It hadn't changed. It's the same answer. All right. Let's get right into it. I want to talk to us about discernment today. Discernment. I want to give a little bit of a, what we would call maybe an apostolic overview of this if we can, because I want to find the working definition of this and how we have to have this in our life, because discernment is something that's very, very important. I'm going to start with just a little bit of a basic teaching if I can. I'm not going to be exhaustive on this subject because I want to get to an application point for us. Um, I want to demystify some of this because I think sometimes, uh, particularly new believers, if they haven't been developed, think that spiritual discernment is just something that, that uh, certain individuals get or certain people or uh, that, that it's just for the elect few and that is not true and we'll see that today. So let me talk about some of the, maybe the types of discernment for a moment and just kind of give you a little bit of a, an overview. This is not exhaustive, but it'll, it'll kind of define a little bit. The first one is there's a natural discernment. God's given mankind a natural discernment. And these are really just judgments that we pass on uh, people and circumstances on ourselves. And they're derived from teachings that we receive in our homes and societies and uh, education uh, centers, uh, the environment, the culture around us. And they're, they're developed. It's developed through natural skills. There's, you learn people's personalities. You learn that there's only so many personality types. And you learn those personality types. And you, you kind of develop uh, a natural skill for discerning people and how they respond. There's a lot of psychological examinations out there that help us understand that. And there's a natural discernment that we have. And we should develop that. And then there's the gift, the discerning of spirits, which is a gift. The discerning of spirits is the discernment derived from the Holy Spirit concerning another spirit. I like the way Dennis Bennett said it in his uh, book, The Holy Spirit in You. He said, by the gift of discerning of spirits, the believer is enabled to know immediately what is motivating a person or a situation. That's a gift that God gives you sometimes in a situation. Uh, I had an individual that w was in one of my organizations and we were getting ready to promote him and take him up and everybody was excited, but I had a check. The more I talked to him, the more I had a check. Something's not right. This is, this is not right. I didn't have any intellectual uh, knowledge. I didn't have any information that really would keep me from promoting him, but I just, there was something that I knew. 
And so I didn't promote him. In fact, I took him over and set him on the bench. Later on, he went to prison for some items. And I was grateful to God that he spared us through this gift of discernment. I didn't know. I couldn't understand. But God allowed that to protect the church, to protect the organizations, to protect people. And sometimes God does that in our life. This is not an everyday thing. We don't walk around and know everything about everybody. But sometimes as we pray and we need that, God gives us the gift of discernment so that we know when a spirit is operating. There's a false supernatural discernment. This discernment is derived from the operation of evil spirits in a person's life. Psychics can tap into stuff. Tarot card readers, whatever, whatever we uh, understand from that world, we realize that there is a dark side people can tap into. And sometimes it amazes me that people are amazed that they can read stuff, and they can read stuff because they can get behind the dark veil in the spiritual realm and read things. And then there is the spiritual discernment that I want to talk to you about today. Spiritual discernment. This is derived primarily from a renewed mind in Christ. It's discernment derived from a mind that has been renewed in Christ. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. This is the application of God's word. Now walk with me for a minute so we get this foundation a little bit. Spiritual discernment is really from a renewed mind as I read God's word. But it is an application of God's word in the natural world where I live. It's where you apply the word to your life and it helps you manifest spiritual discernment. Let me just teach this for a minute. I've got to take this mysticism out of the church because we've got to have discernment. We've got to know what discernment is. Spiritual discernment comes from when I read God's word. That's why it's so important. I don't read God's word to rehearse it so that I can impress somebody with my knowledge of it. I read it because I need it to work in my discernment. Without God's word as a foundation, my discernment will become very emotional. So I need God's word daily in my life and I read God's word because it seeds a foundation. And then when I'm in the world that God has set me in and I live in that, I bring that application out and that creates a spiritual discernment. Paul, that's why Paul said knowledge without an application puffs up. If all we do is sit and talk about the things of God, but we don't get out and, and put them to work in our life, then we don't have very good spiritual discernment. You can be very heady, very knowledgeable, but if you don't work out your salvation, work out your knowledge daily in your life, with your family, your children, on the job, in the work, in the marketplace, at the grocery store, then you're not developing your spiritual discernment. God gave you the ability to develop that. The gift of spiritual discernment can come at certain times and places. But we should all carry spiritual discernment in the church so that we know the difference between good and evil. Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, I don't know God's will for my life. Then you're not discerning. God didn't leave it as a mystery. You should know his will for your life. And you do that not by reading a book. Nothing wrong with reading books. Good books can help you. They can illuminate things. Not by going to somebody that can tell you. Somebody might confirm. But by you interacting with God's word in practice in your life, in the world that you live in, and creating that discernment says, this is what God wants me to do. And you find his will, which is acceptable, good. It leads you to the right places. Hebrews 5 and verse 14. I'm not, I'm not going to be very long. I am going to be very strong. But I, I want us to, 
I want us to have this little bit of foundation before I go into to, to discussing the application of this. Because I'm finding in the body that we're not discerning things as we should. We're letting too many outside voices determine what is right and wrong. What battles we fight. Too many outside voices that are creating division in the church. This ought not be. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14. But solid food is for the mature. Hmm. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Paul just taught you, or the writer of Hebrews, whoever, whoever it was, doesn't matter. It was inspired of God. Scripture just taught you in one verse, which has taken me 15 minutes to try to get to. I'm going to read it again. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. This is what you do. This, this verse is, talks about more about the power of apprehension than the power of comprehension. You can comprehend things and read and learn and grow and develop your mind and it's good, but some things you comprehend, right? You can't fully understand them intellectually. You might not cognitively grab a hold of it, but you can apprehend. That's what this verse is talking about, the two of these being married together. As I read the Word of God and I put the Word of God in me and my mind becomes renewed and I walk that out in my daily life, I get what's called spiritual discernment, but I have to practice it. I have to work on it. It doesn't just come automatically because I read my Bible and God loves me. I have to read my Bible and coordinate myself with the Holy Spirit, with God, with the Word of God. And I've got to put it on the, to, on the table and make it work for me as I walk out my daily life. It's not some spiritual gift that God just puts a little dust over your head and you have it. You walk it out. So the longer you walk with God, the more mature the more discernment you're supposed to be able to have. Now, this is not, does not mean you get to some place where you discern everything and you got it all out. There's always, a, there's always a wrestling. But you should be able to get to the place where you can discern things that you might not be able to understand or you might not have the full knowledge of that can save you from a lot of trouble and a lot of problems. The writer said you have to, by constant practice, train yourself in discernment. So you read the word, you go to work, you go to the marketplace, you visit people, and you're constantly taking the word and putting it as a standard in the place. And you say, I don't, I don't really know the verse or the thing, but that's just not right right there. It's just, it's just not right. Something's, something's not right. And you wrestle with it. And you create spiritual discernment. And it's a mechanism. It's a gift that God gave us that we're responsible for to develop. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be a Christian for 30 years and you can't tell the difference between wrong and right and good and evil. When we talk about spirits, Spirits can be ideas, influences, writing, feelings, inspirations. All of these are not from God. Satan is an artist at disguises. For every good thing God provides, Satan produces a counterfeit. Where there is Christ, there is an antichrist. Where there are prophets, there's false prophets. Where there is a gospel, there are fa false gospels. It is important that we understand we must develop and train in spiritual discernment. Otherwise, the media is going to determine what you call good or light or dark. Listen, I had to preach a few times and there wasn't nobody in here, so I'll take one hand clap and be happy. <laughs> Didn't we, Dr. Buddy?
preach to chairs. I didn't get one negative feedback from them, though. <laughs> Acts 16, 16. Y'all know I love you. That's why I like the Bible, because you have to love me. God didn't give you a choice. Acts 16, 16. Let's go into the application of this, okay? Let's talk about this a little bit and the application, because I think we, we sometimes mystify things in the church, and spiritual discernment has been one of those things that I think people always think, well, somebody else more mature and holy uh, it probably has that, and, and I don't. No, we just read, you read your Bible. That's why you should read your Bible every day, not just to memorize and know, because when you see that in you, and you coordinate with the Holy Spirit and you walk out your life, you create wisdom and discernment and you walk things out. You get better at it. And you can go, mm, nope. And you avoid a lot of trouble. A lot less. We'd close half the counseling centers down if we got this principle. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. I'm going to read just a little bit of this story. And then we're going to talk about it for a moment. It's a great application. Acts chapter 16 and verse number 16. I'm reading out the English Standard Version. This is Paul and Silas. It says, as we were going to the place of prayer, Dr. Luke was the writer of this, so he was along with them, and so he's writing this. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, and Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out at that very hour. Verse 20, they brought them to the magistrates, said, These men are Jews. And they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or to practice. The crowd joined in, attacked them, tore the clothes off, beat them, put them in prison. You know the story. Now what's interesting about that is that what that young lady was saying was absolutely correct. It was absolutely true. I, won't, I promise I won't come off this right here. Am I okay here, Dr. Buddy? What the lady was saying was absolutely truth. They are sons of the Most High God, and they were showing people how to be saved. Do we all agree on that? There was nothing in that phrase that she was touting that was incorrect or untruthful. In fact, I would imagine myself, if I was walking with Paul... And we were on our way to prayer, and this lady was following us every day going, these are, son these are sons of the Most High God. They'll show you the way to be saved. And Paul turns around and rebu rebukes her and casts the spirit out that I would have been like, Paul, you just fired the best marketing director we've ever had. She was giving us incredible advertisement. I, I don't understand why you did that. The Bible says she had a spirit of divination. In the Greek, that word is pneuma python, spirit of the python. I preached this message 20-some years ago. Changed my life. Because I understood something. Not this exact message, but spirit of the python, pneuma. The, the pneuma python, the spirit of the python. It said she had a spirit of the python. It's interesting to note that it was a spirit of the python that the writer chose to, Luke chose to call that a spirit of the python because python is different than a viper. A python doesn't snap at you, doesn't try to quickly inject you with poison. A python tries to slowly, comfortably slither around you. And it has one purpose, and that purpose is to squeeze the breath or life out of you. So while she was saying everything correct, Paul recognized something was off. 
He recognized something was trying to get around him. The Bible tells you that the word of God is active and alive. It's all scripture is God breathes. Y'all didn't mean reading your Bible while you've been on this? Let's try that again. I didn't. All scripture is God breathed. So when you read scripture, the breath of God comes in you. And when you speak the word of God, the breath of God comes out of you. And that is your life. The spirit of the python seeks to sneak and slither around your life and squeeze out the breath and the word of God from your life so that you don't have anything to say. You're just a mere puppet. Paul, recognizing this spirit, even though she was saying the right thing, he knew what she really wanted was his identity. It's an identity crisis. I want to get your identity. I'm calling you the right thing, but I want your identity. And if I can get your identity, then I can control you. Paul, knowing this, said, hold on a minute. Something's off here. I, I discern something's wrong. God didn't give him the gift. I don't believe God gave him the gift of discernment in this case because it happened for many days. I believe Paul was walking out his revelation, his, his salvation. They were on the job doing what they were doing and he was reading the word of God, meditating, cogitating, just getting it in him. And the more he did, the more he kept getting vexed and annoyed. And he's like, something's just not right. You're saying all the right stuff. You, you, you got everything, looks good on the outside, but something I just feel like is constricting me in that. So therefore I rebuked that spirit and it came out. We live in a day and a time where people say the right thing. And they know how to give the right message, maybe even a little bit of truth, and try to lure you away from the things of God. And the promise is they're going to really give you your identity. Your voice is really going to be heard. <laughs> right now I can discern all the different organizations, things and things that you guys are thinking of and thinking I'm preaching against. I'm preaching my message and I want you to preach my message with me too. We clear? I'm preaching the Bible out of the word of God. You stay here with me. It's applicable where it's applicable. Tired of the division that we ought to know better. We have to understand how imperative it is to be able to discern what God is doing. And just because somebody says the right things does not mean they are of God. You say, yeah, but there's truth. There may be truth in it, but their motivation may be to slither in and squeeze the life out of you and take the breath of God from you so you no longer have voice because that's the most powerful thing you have on the earth is to be the voice of God. And the thing about a, the thing about a python is it just feels so comfortable. It's just so easy how it slides around tells you what you want to hear you're a son of the most high God you're anointed you should have your own ministry you don't need to be underneath the authority of another you are anointed of God you should be speaking to the nations telling people how to be saved You better shake that spirit off. You better discern what's slithering around you. You know how many, you know how many people I've seen the python take out because they listen to parts of the truth? They got their own thing going, me and Jesus. Ain't nobody going to tell me. Or this, this group over here has my best interests. Or these people have my best interests. And it seeks to try to give you your identity. 
Now watch, because I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. I really am. <laughs> Nobody believes that. I want you to get this. I want you to have understanding of why we must have discernment. Why we must develop and grow. Why we need people who are farther down the road. Everybody needs somebody that can help them discern on the big decisions of life. To confirm. I don't believe you go to somebody and go, what do you want me to do with my life? You tell me as, oh, you're God. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. We've tried that model. It didn't go good. But as I discern, I should have somebody that I come to and say, this is what I'm feeling, Apostle. What, what, what do you think? And whether you like the answer or not, you wrestle and hear the discernment that they have. Because if you don't discern that, that python slithers around you, you will lose your identity. Had Paul and then succumbed to that spirit, we wouldn't have read the same story. He would have lost his identity as an apostle. He would have become nothing more than a, a divination as she was, pipping his gift to be used for somebody else. Your identity is in Christ. We don't have to turn over to it, but I'll, 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 I'll mention it. You can look at it later. In Matthew 16, 13, Jesus is asking the disciples. He said, hey, who do people say I am? Ah, some say you're Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some John the Baptist or another prophet. There's a whole bunch of... Theories out there, Lord. He said, well, who do you say I am? Peter said, well, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus looked at him in that moment. It's one of the greatest revelations we ever get in Scripture and understand as believers. Jesus looks at him and he goes, you are Peter, the rock, in which I will build this movement. You are the ecclesia, the ones coming out. Because you don't know who you are until you know who Christ is in your life. When you find out who Christ is in your life, he will tell you who you are. You will never have another day of identity crisis in your life. He said, you are Peter. You're the rock. Because when you find your identity in Christ. It is the foundation of all that you do. And when, not, not somebody else says, when you know he is the son of God, the living Messiah, he is my Messiah, he is my God. Then he says, you are done. Here's your identity and your purpose. And you never have to struggle again as long as you stay in Christ. This teaching was so deep. Watch me now. This teaching was so deep that Paul, a great and wonderful theologian, comes along and he says, listen, when you're in Christ, there is neither male nor female. Greek, nor Jew, nor this, nor that, nor this, nor that. There is no division in Christ Jesus. That thusly, our role becomes in the church to model to the world that in Christ, there is no division. There's neither male, female, rich, poor. There is no division. Hang on. I know some of you are going way ahead of me. Just hold on. Breathe. Don't let the pipe the shake. Don't let him around you. Just hear me out. You're going to be mad at me at the end of this. We are first in Christ. When you get a true revelation of who Jesus Christ is in your life, you gain your identity. 
It's the only way you can gain your identity. The whole purpose of the, of the enemy, the whole purpose of so many different movements and organizations has been to try to change the identity of the Christian. To get you to believe this is what I have to do to please God. And Jesus said, no, nah, no, the formula is it's easy. If you know that I am the Messiah, that I am your God, I'm going to tell you who you are. And in that, before I'm anything else, before I'm a male, before I'm an American, before I'm white, before I'm rich, poor, or anything else, first, I am in Christ. And I identify first, before anything else, with those people who are with me in Christ. That is the point of origin where we have no division. Now, let me fix it for some of you. You say, yeah, yeah, but in the world, I know in the world there's division. I understand fully. I'm not naive. I understand. There's injustice, inequality, racism, discrimination, every bit of it. The problem is the world has been telling you how to fix it. They can't fix it. You can't fix in the natural something that's broken in the spiritual. And if we do not understand that we are first in Christ, that we first find this place and then we move from there. That if we don't have our identity in Christ, we begin to ask the wrong questions. I understand all of the challenges of the world. I understand the, the inequality and social injustice and all of those things are present. We have to fight with them. What I'm mad about is the people that are trying to tell me what to do to fight for them. You don't have to agree with me. It's okay. I love you anyway. We're in Christ. This ain't about politics. This ain't about movements, organizations. It's about who we are and what our job is. You're going to get to heaven and the question's going to be, what did you do with what I gave you? You were in Christ. What did you do? Because what we should take to the world is the ability to say, oh, oh, yeah, we're different. When I, when I look at a black person, I see a totally different culture. When I look at a Chinese person, I see a totally different culture. I see all these beautiful things that we do. And yes, throughout history, there has been discrimination, social injustice, and we have to fight to keep that. But in Christ Jesus, I can celebrate these things and walk them out with purpose. And my concern is, is we ha that we have left who we are in Christ for what the python is trying to tell us we should become. People say things, well, yeah, but you've never walked in my shoes. I don't have to. You haven't gone through my struggles. You haven't gone through mine. And what's happened is we've backed up so much in the church that we're afraid to have any tough conversations, deal with any issues, because we can't find our foundation first being in Christ. And here's the, here's the real danger. That if, if I'm not in Christ, if I don't find my identity in that, the byproduct of that is you end up asking the wrong questions. And you ask them with the wrong spirit. I know those things exist. I know they're ugly. We have to fight. But if our foundation is not first together in Christ, and we cannot ask of the Lord, then we end up with the wrong motives the wrong questions. Second Kings, you don't have to turn there, I'll tell you the story, you can look at it later. I'm gonna give you two examples. Second Kings chapter seven. It's the story of Samaria. They were under siege and it was a bad famine. They were, they were eating donkey's heads. They were selling those off for big money. Two ladies were fighting on which child they were going to boil and eat. It was a bad, bad famine. Very bad. 
And the prophet shows up, Elijah shows up to the king of Samaria and he says, hey, listen, about this time tomorrow, you're going to be able to go down and get a loaf of bread for a quarter. He said, he said, yeah, about this time tomorrow, you'll be able to get flour and bread and milk and honey and all that stuff with no problem at all. The Bible says that the officer who the king was leaning on, he was weak, hadn't eaten. He's leaning on this officer's arm. But the officer of the king looked at Elijah and he said, even if God opened the windows of heaven, how could this be? You go to Luke chapter 1, around verse 34, the angel's talking to Mary. He said, listen, you will, you will conceive and have a child, a son. You name him Jesus. And Mary said, how can this be? I'm a virgin. He said, because God will overshadow you. Answered her question, explained it to her. Back in the Old Testament, exact same answer or question to, to, to the prophet. Exact same question. He said, about this time tomorrow you'll get a, get a loaf of bread for a quarter. And the, the officers said, even if God opened the, the windows of heaven, how could this be? And the prophet said, you're going to see it, but you're not going to partake of it. Which came to pass when the siege was lifted and they, all the people ran out on the, on the army that, had, that they'd left, left their post. There was all this food, so the people just had this run on. They ran out and they ran right over the top of the king's servant. And he literally could see them picking up the spoils, but he couldn't touch it. It's a curse to see blessing and not be able to partake of it. But you need to understand how important questions are and the motivation of those questions. They come from a point of frustration, lack of faith, bitterness, anger. If they come from a place that's not godly, that's not faith-filled, then you're probably going to get rebuked. Mary asked the same exact question. It was just as an unbelievable miracle as what the, 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 the officer was looking at. And she said, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And she didn't get chastised. She got blessed. I'm trying to tell you today, people can say the same things. They can ask the same questions. But what is the spirit that comes behind it? You have to have a spirit of discernment. You've always, not just today, they could have preached this message a hundred years ago. Human nature is human nature. There's always going to be evil and evil intent. But we must have discernment. We must know what God is saying to us. We must know how to come from a place of strength in Christ and ask the right questions, cloaked with humility and love and a matter of trust. Mary's was, I don't know how this can happen, but I trust you. The officer was, how could this be? This could never happen. It'll never happen. A lack of faith and to believe that God could ever do it. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. I don't want you to open your mouth anymore and say negative things, okay? I don't want you to take the media that's telling you we're broke and we can't be fixed and project that. I want you to take the word of God and say we are reconciled. We are together. We are unified. We are strong. We will work through the tough challenges. We will answer the tough questions. We may not have it all figured out now, but we will use our discernment to keep off the evil stuff, to keep off the python, to keep the wrong questions out. We'll stay centered in Christ Jesus. We'll listen to good leadership and we will find and project the answers that we know are true, which are in Christ Jesus. Stand with me. I am grateful for the leadership in this house. From Dr. Buddy, Dr. Mary, all the way down. It is a very wise leadership team. I'm grateful for the mature saints in this house. The people that have been here many years and labored. And I feel a great sense of destiny. Great sense of destiny. A heaviness. 
that God is saying, be the answer. Don't fall prey to the spirit of the python. We're bickering and arguing over stuff that we should not be bickering and arguing over in the church. I've traveled, I've, I've been traveling through this kind of like secret Chinese missions meetings. Honoring the mask and the distance and the thing, all of that. But I've traveled, I've talked to churches, to leaders, to people. And there's never been a better time for us to project what it means to be unified in Christ. I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm not telling you which organizations. I'm telling you discern because God put his spirit in you. And when you interact with his word, that's not the job. There's some bad organizations and bad movements and bad things going on out there that do not have the best interest of God and his kingdom and his people. You are a citizen of heaven. And we must discern, we must unify, and we must stand against the spirit of the python. It seeks to take the breath of God out of his people. And we will not let it. Not on our watch. Not on our watch. No. I want to pray with you, for you. I want to say this but right before I pray because I hear I hear this in my spirit I must, I'm going to say what I said in my message this way God has keys yes he gives us keys yes Those keys are principles many times. Truths. They unlock something in your life. You can, get a, you can get a key from God, a truth, and unlock something in your life that you've struggled with for 20 years in one moment. Turn that truth and open it up. We have a lot of things to, to work out and sort out. But listen to me for a moment. There's a lot of anger. That's not, that's not a deep revelation, right? We get that. There's a lot of anger. You turn on your TV, there's a lot of anger. And part of what the enemy's tried to do is tell people, come here, I'll give you voice to your anger. You don't give voice to anger. You can't carry anger without it damaging your life and those around you that you love. And the key to anger that God gives us is forgiveness. That's the key. That's the key. It's the only key that unlocks that door and gets anger out of your life. We're angry because something's happened to us somewhere. All of us have that. I, things in my life I can look back over and go, I'm angry about. If I don't forgive them, I hold on to them. I meditate on them. And then you walk in anger. The Bible doesn't tell you to walk in anger, does it? It tells you to walk in love. And if we need to model anything to the world in Christ, it is that we learn how to forgive. Yeah, but you, 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 you don't understand, Paul. You don't understand, I was done wrong. I know, I know. That's not my argument with you. That's not my argument with any of us. We've been done wrong. Forgiveness is not saying that I, I, I agree with what they did to me. It's saying that what they did to me is not going to drive a stake in the ground, chain me to it, and keep me here for the rest of my life. That I choose to forgive. Because that's the model, the principle, the key that was given to me from heaven. Because I offended. I put Jesus on the cross. And he forgave me. And we have to learn to forgive and walk in forgiveness. Otherwise, you get up every day and you're angry. So I, I watched 
very little TV from the time I watch it and turn it on. It's amazing to me how easy it is to get angry at something. My position, my this, that. This side of politics, that side of politics. Could you imagine what would happen if forgiveness just swept across America? Well, how's it going to do that, you and I? We discern it, we walk it out. Bow your heads with me, please. It's not the easiest message in the world to preach, but it's the one I feel like God gave me for us here at the Life Center, for those listening by way of internet. Because it's very easy to let my need or my desire to be heard pull me away. And that's what the python wants to do. I want to be heard. I want somebody to hear the injustices and the wrongs that have been done to me. But that's not the way we do it. That's not the way God's people do it. We must model who we are in Christ. Church, we must. We have great opportunity in this day. Great opportunity. We must seize. The opportunity of a lifetime has to be seized in the lifetime of that opportunity. And we must seize it. Heavenly Father, I pray now for your people. I pray that we may grow in grace and become spiritually mature. I pray that as we submit to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we become increasingly like Jesus. That we develop a maturity. That we develop discernment. And that as we live and work, develop our discernment that we would glorify you in all that we do. May our senses be trained to discern what is good and evil. To discern the teachings that distort the word of truth. And that we may stand fast on the unchanging and unchangeable word of God. And that we would walk in truth and love to a world that is confused and hurting. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the body. We glorify and exalt you now. There is no other God beside you. And we magnify you in this place in our lives and all that we do. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, Life Center. I love you and appreciate you. Well, let's give the Lord some praise in the house for bringing us truth this morning, truth we needed it here. Yes, in the name of Jesus, we celebrate you, Father. We celebrate you, Holy Spirit. First, I want to thank Apostle Don for bringing us right on message. It was a message we needed. And it's, uh, you know, anything that builds our trust in the Lord edifies, strengthens us. Here's what I want you to do. You may be seated. I know sometimes I have to be seated. I can't stand as long as I used to. But I want to know an activation. You know, he talked about Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. There it talks about the discerning of spirit. We know, we know that at the Life Center, you're supposed to activate everything you learn, put it into motion. And so we, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little exercise. I want you to put one finger on your head and one hand on your heart. Now, I can't do that and hold my microphone, but you do that. And we're going to exercise this. And we're going to cleanse our mind of those things that have come in, we've allowed in. 
and to purify it with our spirit who knows all truth and has brought it. So it says when you get your mind and your spirit aligned, then you are purpose for what God has. You know, I was saying the word of the Lord was earlier, we're in a cleansing time. Every time before the priest would go minister, they had to cleanse themselves so that they would be cleansed. Now, let's do this. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I say, clear my mind, clean my mind, wash my mind from the things that I've allowed to come in that were not aligned with your purpose. Now, on your heart, say, Father, I say, Holy Spirit, teach me, instruct me, and bring my mind and spirit together so that I operate in the spirit of discernment. I give myself to you because I trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now go you into that strength. Come on and uh, let's, we'll be closing out. Thank you, Jesus. Can we give him another hand? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Quickly, we have a um, praise report um, that Michael would like to share very quickly with us. Hallelujah. I just want to thank God. The cross is still powerful. Thursday early, my brother and his wife was about to jump off a bridge and kill themselves. But by that night at 12 o'clock, he accepted God. She recommitted her life back to God. And on Friday, when I was having a dinner meeting to, with a partner, soon to be partner, she recommitted her life back to God. So when I say that the Father yes. and Glory. the love Glory. of Jesus yes. and what he did on the cross is still powerful and still prevalent. He is sovereign. He is good. And the goodness of him is to allow us to repent. So I just praise God for everything that he's done. On, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. What an awesome testimony. And it leads us right into... If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, because they did at that very last hour, they were saved. So that is, if that is you, and even if you're on the internet and you have never said, Lord, come into my life, come into my heart. Even the message that Apostle Don did today, if you don't know him as your Lord and personal Savior, you can't even relate to that message Christ first Christ first in your life so if that is you and you're here today would you raise your hand hallelujah hallelujah you may be joining us live stream today and you said Lord it's time for me to accept you as my Lord and Savior to put you first so that I'll know how to discern Time seizes. I'll know how to discern the voice of the python, the enemy. Hallelujah. Will you repeat after me? Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Mold me. Shape me. Change me. That I might be just like you Lord I love you and I ask you to have your way in my life I surrender all to you this day amen and if you prayed that simple prayer Welcome into the family of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 
you can go to, if you just prayed that, that simple prayer and you've come into the family of Jesus Christ, we want you to go to salvation at lifecenter.org. Again, salvation at lifecenter.org so that we can give you more information about your new walk in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And you may be here today or you may be online and you want to be a part of this ministry that God has put it on your heart that you feel led to be a part of the Life Center. We would ask you to go if you want to be a part of this ministry that we equip, we empower, and we build leaders in this ministry. You can go to Welcome Center at lifecenter.org. Again, Welcome Center at lifecenter.org. And we thank our guests for being here today. And we'd like you just to share your experience. You can go to Welcome Center at lifecenter.org. And we appreciate you coming. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we stand to be dismissed? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you on today for your word. The spirit of discernment. We thank you on today, Lord God that we cast our ballot in heaven, oh God, today. Lord God, that you would be Lord of our lives. Father, we thank you on today for your word, for your message, oh God. We vote for heaven. Ha, we vote for heaven, hallelujah. We vote for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, hallelujah. We cast our ballot on today for our King of kings and Lord of lords who will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. God, we give you praise on today for what you've already done and for what you're going to do. We thank you, Father, as we leave this place and never from your presence, Lord God. We ask you, Lord God, Father, Lord God, to, to give us discernment to give us discernment, oh God, as we continue to be in your word and to learn of you and grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Have a great rest of the day. Amen.